Okay, so what's on the agenda today? Uh, we're going to recap the poll news as well. Um, our uh, featured guest is going to be Watershed. Um, thank, thank you, Jessica, for <laughs> signing up to, <laughs> to talk about um, what you got, what you guys got going on. Um, we actually have a last minute volunteer, Chad, talking about Python SDK, which I know a lot of people are super interested in. And then Temporal Cloud with uh, Pierre and Tim. So a lot of uh, highly, highly requested topics um, going on here. All right, so not to mince words, um, we have the start of local meetups, um, in-person, um, actually meeting face-to-face, -face, talking about temporal and not temporal things. The first one was Temporal London. I really have to thank Charlie Barker for stepping up and leading that. Um, and the second London meetup is going to be April 28th. You can already sign up at Luma slash Tuggle April. Um, Tuggle, Tugs, I, I guess is, is what it's called. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to try and initiate some meetups. Um, it seems like San Francisco is looking the most likely, uh, probably April 25th or 29th, 30th, something like that. We are looking for venues. Um, and, if, and if anyone has like a good venue that they want to uh, volunteer, please let us know in the chat. Um, you can also head into the Slack and go to the Meetup SF channel. There's also Meetup NYC, where we have much less of an idea of uh, where we're going to do. Um, we have a potential venue, but I don't want to announce a date just yet. So uh, obviously, this is not all the cities that we're in. Um, if you are interested in hosting a meetup, please get in touch, and we'll give you all the resources and, and help that you might need. Uh, you know, maybe sponsor some drinks or something. Um, and yeah, like we, we want to help uh, people connect and and talk about temporal and sort of temporal adjacent things. We and obviously don't uh, <coughs> uh, keep in mind that we also have uh, a conference coming up. Actually, um, I didn't put it on this slide, but um, I think we have a date for a conference. We're, we're locked, still locking on, down the venue, but our, our first company conference is going to be August 26. So mark that calendar uh, on, on your, on your uh, schedule as well. Okay. Um, for those in Europe, um, we may be appearing at a couple of conferences in June. Uh, we don't have any meetups planned just yet because we don't have many employees in Europe. Uh, but just in case you're from Europe and looking for stuff like that and feeling neglected, uh, we're coming on, on your way. All right. So uh, this other, other things, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of pieces of temporal content. So for those of you who are with us in January, uh, Chronosphere presented, uh, our friends, uh, Uber alum friends at Chronosphere presented their piece, uh, but also they have a full write-up now. Um, I think their short link is at temporal.io slash Chronosphere. So if you want to learn more about uh, deploy building deployment systems uh, with temporal, um, the, these, these people have by far like one, one of the most comprehensive uh, breakdowns of you know how, how to do that, which I, which I really like. Uh, and in terms of side projects, um, this blog post from Roloff actually is really good because uh, he just took a, a solved a pain point that he personally had with Temporal um, and, and replaced MailChimp and, and probably spent a lot more in terms of his time than, than the money that he saved, but he had a lot of fun in the process and he wrote up about it. So I really like to feature community blog posts. Like if you are a user of Temporal and you like write about us, um, we want to know. We want to help you get uh, get readership, uh, connect with other people, and just get more mileage out of your work. So if you're interested, you know, we really want to encourage this stuff, right? Like just anyone just hacking on stuff or, or writing about their work experience with Temporal, highly, highly welcome. And uh, we'll try to get eyeballs on this thing. And uh, maybe some some opportunities can come out of that. I know that people at Nihilus uh, did check out this blog post and uh, they liked it a lot as well. So uh, people who do emo for a living like it. I think it's, it's a pretty good endorsement. Okay, that's it. Um, that's it for the news. Uh, We're going to hand over to Jessica and team, David and Nate. Um, Watershed is, uh, I always like to, I think in my email titled, I called it like saving the planet hey, with temporal. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jessica, how you doing? Oh, oh, I see, I see. Someone was playing uh, Mary's talk in the background. Okay, sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, I think you can uh, take over from here, Jessica. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, really excited to share a little bit with you all on how Watershed uses Temporal. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm here with um, Nate and David from uh, Watershed as well. We're all engineers working on mostly on sort of carbon footprint measurement. That is a lot of Watershed's core business. Um, so excited to share a little bit about each uh, with you today. Um, so I'm going to go over sort of what Watershed does because 
not you might not have heard of us necessarily um, talk about the kind of asynchronous work we do at Watershed, um, some of the problems we had with that and why we ended up using temporal as a result, um, and sort of walk you through um, an example of a carbon calculation that we actually sort of use a decent amount of workflow orchestration to do. Um, so Watershed uh, was founded on sort of the idea of fighting climate change. Um, we have to uh, we have to make really meaningful process to progress towards massive emission reductions by 2030 in order to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. And uh, Watershed was founded on the idea that businesses are actually pretty major actors in helping move the planet towards a net zero carbon future. Uh, so, so to that extent, um, we uh, partner with companies to, and we've empowered their climate programs. So we have a bunch of customers from software companies like Airbnb and Stripe, um, to food companies like Imperfect and Sweetgreen, um, to apparel companies like Everlane, um, where we help them sort of measure their carbon footprint, figure out what to do with it, reduce it, um, and re make reports on it and sort of like basically action their entire climate program. So uh, through our customers, we manage over 24 million tons of carbon, um, which is actually over five times the carbon footprint of the city of San Francisco, which kind of validates the idea that um, the idea that Watershed can make its, most of its impact through businesses. 45 of our customers have already announced climate plans to be um, net zero by 2030, which is sort of the, the gold standard. And with all of this carbon uh, under management, it actually ends up meaning that data workflows are actually really core to our value proposition. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly that looks like in terms of um, the asynchronous workflows that we write at Watershed. Um, so this, for the first piece of this is carbon data correctness. Um, through carbon data and computation, uh, we perform a lot of emissions estimation by converting basically a, a business's activity data to carbon. So figuring out how to model this data, keeping it up to date, maintaining invariance and testing it is sort of pretty, it's not something that's been done a lot before in the past. So we have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and a result of sort of this kind of data is that we actually operate on medium sized data. So not quite terabytes, but sort of small gigabytes of data that often fits in memory. Um, so sort of our library of carbon data is not ginormous. Um, and neither is our company, our, our customer's data for the most part. So it's often sort of medium sized data that we can usually load into memory, don't have to distribute quite fully, um, but it's still sort of significant. And another interesting thing about um, our, the kind of asynchronous work we do at Watershed is that um, we actually have both short and long running tasks that are sort of like asynchronous. Um, so we have some tasks that are interactive in the sense that like, for example, a data analyst is waiting on the other side um, for the workflow to finish, um, but some tasks that are like much more long running. So sort of anywhere from five seconds to 30 minutes um, is where our workflows end up being. Um, so the problem that we had with our previous sort of asynchronous work um, platform was that we basically had started out with this homegrown Python task queue, um, which was causing problems like primarily actually because we could only write asynchronous work in Python, which meant we had to duplicate code across um, our, our uh, across two languages. Uh, most of our stack is in TypeScript because uh, well, most of our work is very full stack. We um, have a web app for our customers. Um, but we wanted to be able to share some of that business logic with some of our asynchronous workflows. Um, so that was a pretty big pain point. Like whenever you had to write something that was not going to finish properly and like a server call, uh, you had to go write in Python, which is kind of annoying. Um, and we also wanted something that could scale sort of for the next few years. Um, this sort of homegrown, this, this in-house solution was written at a time where we were like maybe like eight people and like four engineers or something. And the engineering team has been really scaling since then. So. Um, at the time we were considering solutions to this, we were probably around like a 20 person engineering org. So we wanted something that could scale more broadly to uh, sort of that, uh, th those developers, as well as to our customer base, which was also rapidly growing at the time. So we wanted something that would scale um, for at least a little bit without us having to build our own platform team in house. Um, and one of the sort of uh, one of the results of this, right, was that we have we also scaled our, our scaled our data analyst team. So we kind of went from one or two analysts pressing a button a few times waiting for a workflow to finish to many analysts pressing many buttons all the time. And so we actually ran into some of those, some of those problems with scale, um, which motivated um, our uh, investigation temp into Temporal. Um, so Temporal um, ended up being a pretty nice solution because it seemed to fit our needs for both orchestrating slow running and long running work, um, which was kind of nice because we could share the same framework um, between the two. Um, the idea of workflows as code, I think a lot of people call out is really compelling to developers. Um, a lot of our workflows just have a lot of business logic and it's really nice to share sort of writing that, that the process of writing that with the rest of our code base. 
um, and sort of like the main value prop of temporal, right, is like workflow state management. Um, we didn't have a lot of features in our sort of in-house Python task queue. So temporal gave us retries, it gave us timeouts, um, nice UI, and sort of all the other abstractions in particular defined by temporal um, gave us a really good toolkit to solve our needs um, and sort of build more workflows as we grow. Um, so I'm going to hand, hand it over to David, who's going to talk through one of the, an example of one of these. Yeah, so to talk about one of the ways that Temporal helps us orchestrate, I first have to explain a little bit about estimating emissions. Um, here's one example of one of the kinds of calculations that we might do. If a customer tells us how many employees they have working from home, we try to estimate how many emissions those people are producing in connection with their work. And electricity usage is just one of multiple ways that these people produce emissions while working from home, but we'll focus on that one. And in the end, what we want to do is represent emissions per month per employee for electricity usage. So we do that by chaining together a series of unit conversions, essentially. Um, in this example, we go from work days and square feet of home office space per employee to kilowatt hours per month to emissions per month per employee. Um, so at a high level, we have a bunch of individual unit conversions, and we're figuring out how to chain them together into emissions, two kind of types of data, the, the unit conversion and the emissions equation. Can we go to the next slide? Um, yeah, so every time that we enter a new unit conversion into our system, as you can see from the previous slide, like we will always be entering new unit conversions. There's kind of an infinite uh, amount of data that we can add going to an infinite level of granularity. Um, but every time we do that, we need to perform a variety of actions. Uh, we run the data through some checks. We sync some data stores um, like BigQuery, Parquet files, Postgres databases, and we regenerate the emissions equations, which is itself a multi-step process. And then after those equations are generated, we want to run a series of end-to-end -end tests, which aim to ensure that the new equations are like reasonable and they're actually working the way that we intend them to. Um, thinking in terms of temporals, workflows, and activities, and especially like workflows that can trigger other workflows, has been a really powerful way for us to structure and understand and monitor orchestration logic like this that can get pretty complex, and so allow it to like allow us to extend the functionality without feeling like we're losing control and not able to wrap our heads around it anymore. Um, so by organizing our logic with activities and workflows, we get these solid abstractions. We get the configurable retries and timeouts for each step. We actually think of these things as activities and workflows and it helps us communicate about them. We get resilience to interruptions from deployments and infrastructure hiccups, which has been really important for us. We deploy very, very frequently um, and hooks for observability that we can apply to each step. So yeah, I, this slide is attempting to demonstrate how Temporal has helped us manage the complexity by providing the robust framework for coordinating all of this interdependent work that gets kicked off when you do something just as simple as committing a new unit conversion. And that's what we wanted to present briefly. Um, if any of this sounded interesting to you, we are hiring at Watershed. We're, and as Sean said, we're working on one of the most critical problems humans face right now, and we're grappling with the challenges of complexity and scale and data quality that come with this problem space. And we're looking forward to using Temporal um, and increasing our uh, expertise on it over time and taking advantage of all the features they offer. Thank you. Okay, round of applause, everyone, for, for that. That was awesome. <laughs> um, we're going to do a bit of Q&A. Uh, so if anyone has questions on uh, Watershed or Watershed's uh, uh, very, uh, I, I really like the system diagram, uh, but you know, Watershed's usage of Temporal, uh, now's a really good time to throw it in the chat. Um, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to open with a very general question. Uh, typically, people, when they get started uh, with Temporal, they'll, they'll pick something conservative that they can start out with. But then once you get ramped up, you find other use cases for it. Any any um, any sort of future use cases coming to mind? 
Yeah, I think we've already sort of come across it already. We, we started off with wanting to use temporal as very much like an orchestration system for uh, simple linear workflows. But the example that David showed was sort of like, we started uh, going to child workflows. Um, David, I don't know if you want to talk about any, like you started using heartbeats recently or uh, our syncs and interceptors that we started using in terms of feature, temporal features. Yeah, yeah, we've gradually worked from like just replacing the task queue idea, the simple task queue idea that we had in Python to taking advantage of interceptors in order to, um, and syncs. These, these might be specific to the TypeScript SDK, but essentially these are hooks now. so that we can, okay, um, so that we can- Well, intercept, inter, uh, go in uh, Java, they have interceptors, but not syncs. Okay, okay, yeah. So this gives us hooks that we can use to like perform really detailed logging um, send out messages about workflow completion. Like we have a Slack bot that will, uh, for specific workflows, we can send a message to the person who ran it indicating when it was done because they shifted their attention somewhere else because it took more than a couple of minutes. Um, additionally, yeah, we've been taking advantage of heartbeat timeouts and trying to, trying, trying to get a really firm grasp of like, how do we maximize that, that retryability feature of Temporal? Yeah, we're, we're looking into uh, creating utilities to help you visualize that to make it more intuitive. Because right now, you you, you know, uh, we you just have to read, read a bunch of flavor text. I almost think of this as like a, you know, when you're playing a card game, there's a bunch of rules in, in text, and you just kind of have to read it and kind of simulate it in your mind. Um, so hopefully, there's more visualizations to help you understand that. Um, I think heart beating is is basically essential for anything, uh, you know, long running uh, activity wise. Um, and then uh, the the thing that we maybe have not stressed enough before that actually took me like a year at Temporal to learn was that you can sort of resume from progress um, as as part of a side effect of the heart beating, right? Like uh, if you if your activity was like fifty percent done and your worker failed for whatever reason, you can actually resume from that fifty percent start point and then continue from there. Um, so heart beating is is really cool there. Um, okay, so uh, we have a couple questions from the community. So Chad actually was asking about programming language breakdown. So you mentioned Python and TypeScript. My impression was that you're primarily TypeScript, but what's what's the real situation? Yeah, so we're primarily TypeScript. Um, we try, we use Python sort of primarily for data processing work. Um, so seeing the Python SDK coming up next in this community meetup is very exciting to us. Yeah, um, yeah. Most of our business logic is in TypeScript, um, and our hope is sort of make Python a very stateless, like data processing only language. But Python and TypeScript is what we're working with right now. And so we imagine like having our temporal worker <clears throat> primarily written in TypeScript, or the workflows written in TypeScript calling out to maybe Python workers that perform specific activities that use pandas or DuckDB, other Python specific libraries. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, and then one more on testing. Uh, and this is gonna be tricky for us. <laughs> How did you go about testing your workflows? <laughs> We tested the business logic within our activities. Um, we don't really have, we don't have automated testing for workflows. Um, we mm. do sort of have, uh, we have a few cron jobs that make sure like um, everything kind of makes sense. Yeah. yeah we started, uh, and, uh, I was going to say, oh, also, started, also, also, okay, go ahead. Good. Good. Sorry. Started trying to um, test the workflow logic, realized we were just like doing some very elaborate just mocking of all the activities yeah. and then verifying they were called with the right arguments and thinking yeah. like, this could be nice if there was a like utility that that made this really easy and straightforward for us, but uh, it might not be worth the overhead at this point. What's that, Chad? I was saying it's coming. The testing framework for TypeScript is rounding out, and you'll be able to do all sorts of fun things there. Nice. Yeah, it's it's part of um you know uh our type uh, TypeScript. SDK is in beta um, and people are very un uncomfortable with the beta. It's beta because we don't have production ready features like the testing suite, which we are really well, working on right now. Um, so I know people are really excited about that. So it's, uh, it's on the way. Um, and yeah, so, okay. I, I assume that's also covered uh, uh, Nick's, Nick's question about um, sort of integration testing and it looks like. Um, and Josh, uh, how are you deploying Temporal at the moment? Oh, there's a really interesting story here uh, because uh, Jessica was responsible for kicking us, kicking off our collaboration with Render. Well, we're currently on Temporal Cloud, which is another exciting thing that's coming up in this meetup. Mm -hmm. So very topical to Watershed's use of Temporal. 
Um, initially, we tried to deploy, um, so use render as an infrastructure service. Um, so uh, we sort of tried to deploy it initially through render, um, found that uh, it, we ended, we, got it, we got it to work, but we found that a temporal cloud was better for a use case just because we didn't want to have to deal with that, um, the, the, the server part of temporal. Um, so I think the currently like the render, the render at YAML template that there is on the website was inspired by my first render template. Yes. Yes. And I mean, it's been, it's been really great because I kicked off, a, they, they got interested in supporting yeah. us better. Yeah. Um, and you can host workers on render, uh, you know, they're in, we host in our or temporal cloud. Render, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, and I think there are also fellow Stripe alums. Um, so there's a bit of Stripe Mafia business going on here. Um, so, uh, and then Josh, uh, to just follow up with your question, uh, no, we, we, we recommend uh, deploying the four core temporal services separately uh, in production. Um, okay, uh, I think that is it for questions. If anyone else has more, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, some of these, uh, Jessica, David, Nate, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm going to Cue up the applause track uh, for everyone. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you see, I know. Acceptance speech. Um, no Oscar jokes. I, I've, I've had too many Oscar jokes, actually. Um, but no, thank you so much for your, for your time. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, I'm just going to keep moving because people are very interested in Python and I don't want to stand in your way. Chad, um, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, I am Chad and I am writing the Python SDK. And it will not let me share my screen while another participant is sharing. That's what it said. But oh, I, I got you. 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 I was so I had to share my audio just to get the applause track in. It was very important. Well, <laughs> I don't. I will go without applause. I'll just no, 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 no. Go, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. If it isn't clear, we know priorities at Temporal. Okay, so. Um, basically, we all know everybody wants a Python SDK, and temporal SDKs are a little bit smarter than your run-of-the-mill clients, right? They have state machines, they have a lot of logic, data conversion, interception, all sorts of other things that they have to do. So it's not necessarily easy to just put a little thin layer. So when they were developing the, when we were developing the TypeScript SDK, we built a Rust core so that we would not have to continually recreate the same state machine and logic and all the complexity. Well, now uh, Python is going to leverage that Rust core. So essentially what a temporal SDK is, is it's two things really. It's a client to communicate with the server and it is a worker to run your workflows and activities. And that worker can actually be broken down into two types of workers, right? You can run your activities, you can run your workflows. And then there are a whole bunch of ancillary things, interceptors and data conversion, exception management, and just all sorts of, of other little things. So what we've decided with the Python SDK is to break it down into a few phases. The initial phase, phase one, uh, which is already complete, is a full featured client and full, cap well, 99% capability for activity workers. So you can run activities in Python right now just fine from any other language. So that might help y'all at Watershed. If you want to fire up a Python activity, have it. It works just fine. And, you know, create, uh, um, invoke it from a TypeScript workflow, no problem. Um, and then, and I'll go through how, to, uh, how it looks real quick here in just a second. Um, and then the next phase, the phase that I'm actively working on once I get off this meeting, is uh, developing workflow support inside the workers. And that's fairly complicated due to a lot of the things that we support with workflows. And then the final phase, which may not have a whole lot of user visibility, is about sandboxing those workflows in order to prevent non-determinism from creeping into your workflows, which is an important concept for us, but uh, may not be as visible to others. So. The completed, uh, right now we have version one alpha out there, right? The only version out there, it, uh, it is a full featured client and it contains activity support. And it's fairly simple to use. Um, basically, you can create a client by giving it where you wanna go and a whole bunch of other options that aren't shown here. You can start a workflow and you can wait on the workflow or signal the workflow or cancel the workflow or query it or all the other things that you expect a client to do. In addition to that, we have activity support. Now I shouldn't, hold on, I should just show. 
how it looks in here. So an activity is basically just any function. Now we've actually changed this in phase two to require a decorator on top of this, but for the version that you would get from the Python packaging now, this would be it. Right? So basically here's a very simple activity. Inside, um, and then I have a Golang worker that invokes this activity. So it, it's to show, because I don't have workflows inside of Python yet, it's to show that another language can easily execute and run activities, right? So you literally just create a worker. We uh, leveraged a lot of existing constructs in Python to be as clean as possible, specifically with async. So you could create a worker. Um, this is a client executing that Golang workflow and that will invoke this activity and return it. It's really that simple. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a full featured client. So all the things that you could want to do with a client um, and then a almost full featured with the minor exception of async activities, uh, which is an off, not very often used piece. Um, we have activity support too. That's that. And it's, more advanced than just normal, oh, look, you have an async function and it can run, it's an activity. No, we support synchronous functions. We even support multi-process functions and make sure that all of the pieces back and forth are pickleable. So if you have, you know, we support all the heart beating and everything that you might need inside of an activity. So it's, it's fairly feature rich. However, it is alpha and being alpha, means you might not want to marry to it. We're already, we've already changed some of the API and we'll probably continue to do so in this latest phase. So um, that's phase one. It's out there, it's alpha, you know, use at your own risk, but it works type of deal. And we would love feedback. Um, I'm, I'm not getting a whole bunch of feedback probably because people are scared of alpha and rightfully so, but anything that breaks, anything that doesn't feel very Pythonic, send it to me. We have a whole SDK Python channel inside of Slack. Um, you can open up issues on here. You can hit up our form anyway. So the next phase is phase two, and that's to get the actual workflows going, right? So here's an idea of a very simple activity and workflow. You have an activity, it does something. Notice the latest phase will add a decorator. And you have a workflow. And after much discussion in, uh, in the open about whether we should use classes or functions for workflows, due to the fact that workflows carry several other things such as signals and queries, it makes more sense as a class. Uh, we actually deviate a little bit from TypeScript here, but you'll notice that all of our SDKs, Go and Java as well, tend to do what's best for the feel of the language. And this uh, works best with Python. So essentially, Here's just a workflow executing a local activity of say hello. I will note that you, you might see a type annotation here or there. Inside the library, it is completely typed. So um, you will get, this will um, automatically be inferred. This argument, this would fail a MyPy check if this were an integer instead of a string from this function. So you have full typing. And then there's, here's how you might, might run it. This, I just used a stop event because I didn't, didn't think of anything better. But, um, and here's a little bit more of an advanced workflow. So start a workflow. This one just constantly runs a greeting. And if it gets a signal to update something, it does uh, this is how you uh, handle a signal. Um, this is how you might handle a query. They're all typed, they're all clean. Um, we have more, there's more advanced concepts with dynamic handling of different things. But at a high level, this is how, this is how uh, workflow might look. In the future, we will look to sandbox this in an interpreter that prevents non-determinism, but there's a lot to be discussed around that. So at a high level, that's that's basically it. I don't, I'll open to the floor for questions. Yeah, um, nice work, um, Chad. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions about uh, the Python SDK, now's a really good time. Um, especially if the watershed folks are interested, um, you're welcome to, to say hi, <laughs> uh, but no, no pressure. Um, Robert asks if this is making use of SDK core. I think it is, right? It is. And so what, uh, so what it's using is it's actually using a PyO3, which is a Rust project that bridges uh, CPython with uh, Rust. 
It uh, right now we only publish wheels for a few architectures. So if you're using a Mac M1, you'll have to build it yourself right now. Sorry, we're getting our work in there. But um, otherwise, um, all the other common architectures are present and Mac M1 will obviously be present very soon. But it's very easy to build, you know, and we use we use poetry and other such things. But yes, it does use Rust Core. And if you yeah. migrated all your engineers to M1 recently, you'll find <laughs> that it is very easy to build. And I would love feedback on the difficulty of building it. Yeah. Um, it, you should be well, able to like literally clone it. And so long as you have uh, Rust present on your machine, like uh, basically just use Rust up and just like NVM if you're TypeScript people. Um, and if you have that present on your machine, a poetry install and you're done. It, it will take a minute because it has to compile some, some hardcore rust, but it'll work. Awesome. Um, okay. Uh, well, I also, I do, I do like the attention that you're paying to types. Um, that's something that we care a lot about because we want to help people fall down the pit of success. Um, I, there was, there's an interesting type issue with like uh, some bug that you had to mm -hmm. uh, wait for to, to finish or resolve. Do you want to, mm -hmm. Discuss a little bit about that. I thought sure. It was I mean, if, to... if people are if people are curious about <laughs> that kind of detail, so yeah, we do uh, support types, but like TypeScript with JS, um, Python people are obviously not required to use types, and all of this will work just fine without. Um, but we support all sorts of inferences, and we're basically at the bleeding edge of what Python types support. Even though the whole SDK is three point seven only, we and plus, and we test on three point seven plus. So if so long as you're within that range, you're good. Um, yeah, I hit an issue where basically some languages allow you to extract the parameters of a function and then like curry a couple of off. Because for instance, when you invoke a workflow like this, um, that's the class method and that's not necessarily an instance of this. Therefore, the initial parameter is self, which is typed as this, but you shouldn't have to, you know, have self there in order to get this first parameter. Unfortunately, MyPy does not support the latest PEP that has concatenate, which allows you to curry off a, a parameter from the param spec. So we just have a few overloads. So that's what I'm waiting on. But the PR is in process. They're, they're working on it. Uh, the way I pitch this is we bend over backwards for you to have type safety, but also uh, a nice looking intuitive API. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> yeah, if this were, if this were an, an integer uh, and you ran a type linter in Python or using your favorite IDE, it would be like, run does not accept an integer. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we support, uh, our parameters support uh, Python data classes natively as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, lastly, where do, uh, could you reiterate where people can try out uh, whatever is possible to try and then where people can find you on Slack. Sure. So um, I am Chad Retz on Slack, probably the only Chad, but yet the least Chad of all Chad. And um, in the SDK Python channel, uh, you can really, if you make any comment there, like if I even see you typing, I might show up. So any comment in the SDK Python, I'm happy to chat. Um, this is the primary repo. Feel free to give us a star. Um, and it has uh, documentation on how to get it. All your standard Python methods for obtaining your favorite libraries are supported. But again, we don't have all architecture supported. So you may, it may end up getting the source distribution and trying to build it. Um, and then we also have a samples project that has one whole sample at the moment for the alpha version. And that sample is to use activities from another language. Uh, so samples project, GitHub project, Slack channel, SDK-Python in the public Slack. Um, the, com uh, the community forums is also a way to get in touch. And we are actively, I just merged this this morning, we are act in active development of workflow uh, workers. Um, awesome. Well, round of applause, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Chad, for... Uh 
jumping into present about Python is very exciting and it's amazing how quickly it's coming along. And I think uh, hopefully we are getting better and better at this every SDK that we ship. Um, already out of the box, you're working on things like upsert search attributes and testing. And, and I'm like, yeah, we didn't have that in the yeah. test. Yeah. That, uh, so, dot, net, dot net will be following in its footsteps soon too. Dot net, yep. Yeah. Uh, and then hopefully a third language this year that we haven't announced. Um, okay, so finally, uh, our last two speakers, Pierre and Tim, you're up to talk Temporal Cloud and answer all the questions. Like, when can I get it? Well, thanks, Sean. All right, let me share my screen, really. Uh, here, and then slide show. <clears throat> can you see that? Yes, yes you're good. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, the famous uh, Zoom uh, intro. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Uh, all right, well, we're here to talk about the kind of like a little bit of intro on the cloud. So super excited to be chatting with you. Uh, so I'm Pierre Ettori and, and Tim is going to be my uh, co-host here. Uh, we have like the sales mugshot. Maybe we should have like taken one that's a little bit sales <laughs> less salesy, <laughs> so, but that's all good. Um, I'm going to skip super quickly through like Temporal. I mean, everyone here knows about it. You know, it's clearly the orchestration engine, you know, for managing distribution, uh, distributed application states at scale. Um, a lot of many use cases. Uh, we have been through it. So I'm going to skip um, to that. I think also the Watershed guys uh, team did a really good job kind of like showing on some of the use cases. Um, the kind of a key thing that we see from, from Temporal, we talked about it, um, clearly reliability, be able to kind of like run your application in a consistent state all the time, productivity, it's work first code, easy way for you to like code your logic, complicated logic, and really make basically like developer experience better. And then you're getting all the feature and control basically over, you know, retry times out and, and kind of like managing your application. There's a ton of like uh, document and, and Sean, I think, and Tim, I have done like a lot of like session about it. So if you want more detail about it, like please feel free to go back to that. Uh, we're just going to jump more into um, Temporal Cloud. So as you guys are familiar with it, there are really kind of like two sides of it. It's really what are you running yourself today and what is the server doing? And so today you have your application code, which is, has also your Temporal client. And then you have this notion of worker that typically run within your environment. And then when you install Temporal and when you use Temporal, you have this huge uh, piece of it, which is Temporal Server, that do a lot of basically the state management and handle your timer and has databases and allow you to scale and you know the gRPC front end and queuing and all and all those things. Well, in that, basically Temporal fits really nicely in delivering a cloud model because you know if you look at the left side, it's really stuff that you are running and then if you look at the right side, when you think of like running your temple server, those are like what you have to drill and the team that you have to manage and, and basically upgrade and patch. And that's really where we're focusing temporal cloud. So what is temporal cloud? The goal of temporal cloud is really to be true to like our tagline that we have on our website. It's like more coding, less plumbing at the end of the day. It's like the goal is to enable you to focus on your business, focus on your application, you know, make basically like the world a better place. And, and we handle like the low level, like dirty detail of like running the server. So what does it mean? Well, we're offering a production grade, basically cloud offering and, and server, which means we take care of all the upgrade, of all the patching support. We have 99.9 .9 SLA today. I think we probably are much better than that for being conservative. Uh, and, and working to do a lot more than that. Um, you get a full team, a 24 by seven support. Um, so really focusing, focusing again on like, you know, being true to that, like you're gonna be running your core application. You're gonna be running like the most important part of your application and we wanna be here for you. And we wanna make sure that this is reliable and working for you. So really kind of like going after that, that mojo. And that's really where the, you know, we are in the business of offering reliability and that's really where we are with Temporal Cloud. Then the second thing to keep in mind is like we build for scale. Um, I think the Watershed team talked about it, but I, I think Tim is going to talk through like some of the use cases we are seeing. Well, you know, you have to run, your business is going to grow. If you're successful, you're going to be running in more region. You're going to be running in different places. You're going to need to support different type of application. You're going to need to like scale with more team managing and everything. So Temporal Cloud is really meant for that. It's built for that scale. Like we are running in many, many regions and we're adding a lot more depending on what you need today. And also kind of like targeted that, that 
we know how to run Temple Server. We have years of expertise and team just built basically around the operation to run Temple uh, Server. And so like being able to see, uh, like really truly um, support those type of like throughputs that you're going to need. Uh, so a high latency sensitive application or kind of like high throughput type of application or just in general, maybe like less throughput, but many, 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 many different set of applications that you need to scale. The second angle is really around security and compliance. Like we are in the business of doing, you know, reliability for you, but also at the same time, we truly understand how this become part of like your core environment and your core application. So security and compliance at heart. The first thing that we did actually is being stuck to compliance. We already have a head of security. That's the first thing we hire. Like in typically, like when you see company at our stage, like this is someone you get much later. This is really to tell you like how much focus we are putting around security. And then we're going to go a little bit more into that. And then the beauty of it is really now you get basically this managed version of Temporal with a consumption-based model. Uh, and we're going to in a minute into why this is important. But I, I think really one thing to keep in mind when, when why basically company turns you know, to Temporal Cloud. A um, couple of different elements, but the key thing to remember is the first one, you're going to have flexible workloads. So you're going to have some use case where, you know, like the difference between your mean time and your peak time is pretty much going to be the same. So then in that case, well, you're building your cluster, you're building your environment in a way that's pretty standard. But then we have also some companies where that difference in the peak time, for example, they are like events coming or like special Black Fridays, whatever that is, where this notion of a peak time become really important. Then the challenge with it is now you need to start building your environment and your infrastructure, you know, to support basically those, those peak time. With Temporal Cloud, you just pay, you know, for what you use. So again, kind of like clear, kind of like CapEx saving here because now you just pay for what you use versus having to predict. It's kind of like the same reason you use cloud, <laughs> play for the same economics here. The second thing is, as the use cases are going to grow, as you're going to get more onboarding, more teams, as basically you're going to have more and more things to support, the, at some point, you start moving from a CapEx cost to really an OpEx cost, where you're going to see more and more team needed to support, basically, in patch, secure, you know, like databases, system that you have, moving from SQL to Cassandra, you know, it could be less, it could be all the systems that are needed right now to run temporal. Um, server, like you're going to shift basically the, the spans basically from CapEx to OpEx. Again, like this has nothing to do with your core business. This has nothing to do with you delivering better application and focusing on your core business. And so again, here, that's why we have a team dedicated to that. We can scale our team across many, many customers, makes more sense. And so you really goes into like salary saving as you kind of like get there. So we handle the patching, the upgrade, the monitoring, and you're getting a full dedicated team basically to support your temporal server. Um, also, since you're working closely with our team, you see like how much we care for the open source uh, um, community. And so it's just really work with basically all of us at temporal and you know, get basically that access. So we help basically like work with the developer. You don't need developer staff to really kind of like take care of the of the support of the of the infrastructure or things like that, like really kind of like uh, again work with us. So again, more like uh, you know salary savings and team savings. And then finally, again, it is we are in the business of delivering reliability. That's the core thing. Like if there's one core thing, is like Temporal Cloud, we are meant to like in the business of delivering reliability. And so this notion of an uptime is really important. Once you're going to run Temporal Server yourself, what we are seeing is. People having nightmare about it. It's like, well, it's running right now. But if it crashes, what happened? How am I going to troubleshoot it? How quickly am I going to be able to troubleshoot it? What is going to be? Well, you now don't have to worry about it. Like we have basically this 99.9% .9 of like uh, uptime. You know, again, like this is increasing. We are working hard to like get that. But really think of like what the downtime would cost you. And then just like offloading that to a different team. I'm not going to go to that slide too quickly, but kind of like also for you to like keep in mind as you're thinking of the value of going to cloud. It's also like we are building a cloud offering around it. So it's really like, uh, you know, over time, what you're going to see is you're going to see dedicated thing that's going to help you basically write, basically, uh, you know, support your environment better, more visibility, more tooling around dashboarding and things like that. 
really thinking of like those operational capabilities over time. Like how do you deal with disaster recovery? How do you do like no downtime upgrade? How you do uh, multi lower, you know, uh, sorry, multi availability zone failover or things like that. So thinking of like those um, operational capabilities that we are going to be able to offer over time with, with Temple Cloud. So again, like really, really focusing on helping basically the, the open source community and at the same time starting to offer more and more kind of like services over time that you're going to see. Um, we're not going to go through like a specific roadmap here, but something I really want you to kind of like keep in mind here is like one of the first question we get is like, well, okay, what does that mean from a security standpoint? Because like this is part of our core application. Like what are we going to do about it? Like how do you think about it? Especially as we are dealing with like large, you know, um, regulated companies or things like that. This become one of the key things. And here, like the key thing to remember is like Temple model fits really nicely in this kind of like cloud economics and cloud model because you run your code. Like we don't need to see your code. You run your code, you run your data, you own it, you do whatever you want with it. And then what we did is we enabled this tool that's called a data converter. And um, I, I believe we have also had like talks about it. So if you get some more questions, I'm happy to do a follow up on that. But this notion of a data converter really enable you to basically encrypt and decrypt any traffic going to kind of like the cloud offering. So PII data, whatever you need in your payload, we don't see any of it. All of that gets basically encrypted and then we just get basically, and then we just provide the, the service that Temple also uh, provides. Um, but again, security is key for us. So we have our PI authentication, we have our user authorization, we have MTLS encryption, encryption address, basically with the system. RBAC is one of the big things that of course, once you start running Temple at scale, you need to start thinking of like multi-tenancy within an organization. You're gonna have team A and team B having different projects. Maybe if you're regulated, you need to make sure that like team A cannot use basically stuff from team B, you know, and all those things. So like kind of like as you scale the organization, again, like how do you protect, who can do what, what are like those different roles that we need. And so we're you know, about to deliver all of that in, in the cloud offering itself. Um, Tim, do you want to take over from here? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, to, to largely wrap it up here, but a, a very common question we get from folks too is when is, um, when's the right time for us to, to start considering the cloud? Uh, or when do you typically see organizations start um, engaging with you about potentially migrating to the cloud? And for us, we really see it run the whole gamut from folks who are um, kind of greenfield developing all the way through, hey, we've been running cadence in production and temporal in production, and now we're looking to, to migrate over to you. So I would say broadly speaking, once you're familiar with the, <clears throat> familiar with um, temporal, you've actually started building with it and you're tracking towards running temporal in production, that's the right time to start talking to us. Um, as you all know, or anybody who's tried to actually engage with or use the, the SaaS service, um, we do have a, a, a pretty, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, a lead time before we can actually onboard folks. And so we're working with a wide variety of, of organizations right now to bring them through the process of going from self-hosted into the temporal cloud. Um, but we're happy to discuss it really with that, discuss the cloud and the offering with really anybody uh, who's ready to run production workloads. And so with that, you know, the easiest way to get a hold of us is if you just go to the temporal um, homepage at temporal.io, upper right hand corner, there's a um, cloud wait, wait list button. You can click it, give us some basic information about your organization, your workloads, and maybe um, yeah, timing and a, a variety of other things that are of, uh, of interest for us. Or you can always just ping us directly at sales at temporal.io. Um, and that'll come to, to myself and the rest of the sales organization. Then we can, um, we can build off of that. So, um, with that, that's like really all the prepared content we had just to introduce um, the SaaS service and, and we're kind of pull back the uh, veil on uh, what we're building and, um, and give some folks some initial um, data and facts around the, the service itself. I can see there's been a few questions that have come in. Uh, so maybe I can hop over to those and, and pick out a few of the ones that are probably most relevant. So pricing model. Um, so today we are, as, as Pierre referenced, it's a consumption-based pricing model. Um, we don't have uh, content to walk through the details of the, the pricing model today, but we're more than happy to follow up with anybody directly to, to set aside 30 minutes and bring us through it. But at a high level, it really breaks out into three different uh, core buckets. We price really off of what we call actions, which is um, essentially a count of, of, of workflow 
workflows and then all the things that happen within a workflow. So activities, retries, timers, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's one core uh, metric that we charge against. The other big core metric is state under management or storage. So uh, as payloads come into the temporal server, we're managing that through the course of the uh, workflow itself. And then um, uh, as we apply that storage to retention policies, uh, we charge for that storage. And then there's a support line item charge as well. I was just going to add one thing, Tim. I, I think the, the key thing to think in terms of pricing is really like, we're here to provide value. That's why we went with consumption-based model. Like we want to be rewarded on like, the value we can provide to you guys. And so that's also kind of like how we think of that price. It's like, you know, like the thing that you're going to be using, like space, you know, with your payload, depending how much data you need, like this is one thing. And then kind of like what are like those functions that you're going to be using that do give you value to your application or things like that. So it's really kind of like working together again here, you know, to like incentivize us to like, we just basically like give you more services and more value to what you're getting. So this uh, also means it's a helpful resource as a developer because I can quickly just uh, ramp up my cluster and just try out things without like being duck into this uh, monetary hole. Quickly. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're, we're, our goal is right to remove friction, make it you know ease of access to the tool, uh, use the service when it's actually solving problems, and when it's not, you can shut it down and not be on the hook for any charges. Um, which actually leads pretty well into a next question, and maybe Pierre, you can comment on it. Uh, Marco asked if there's any ETA when um, the service will be generally available and we won't have to work through the, the waitlist process. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. We're working hard on it. Uh, you know, we're trying to get something, you know, more available at least. Uh, I don't know, um, this like second half of this year. Uh, I think stay tuned on that. Uh, I think we're working hard to kind of like get an official date and, and define everything. Um, we are pretty working actively through like our, you know, waitlist also. So like waitlist is not just a waitlist, like Tim, you know, myself and, and the entire team is really looking at it. Um, so please, like, that's also like a great way to kind of like get started. Uh, you know, we do support already people that are basically running production applications. So waitlist here is more about us kind of like getting all our system in place and making the onboarding easy and things like that and not the quality and the, again, the reliability of, of the service. Um, so please like do feel free to like reach out on the waitlist and stay tuned basically on more like official dates uh, coming later this year. Um, and then Ch Sean, let us know when we, we run out of time here, but I'll keep on moving through qu questions until you um, uh, throw the flag. Um, Good. Are resources like storage compute shared across different companies? So maybe Pierre, can you comment on the multi-tenant nature of the product and, um, and how that probably impacts things like security and um, kind of logical separation of namespaces and whatnot? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So we are offering a multi-tenant service. Again, like the thing to keep in mind is like, in terms of code execution and all of that, all of that run basically within your organization. So none of that goes to like Temple you have the choice of basically encrypting. So anything going to like Temple is already encrypted. And then in the system itself, that's why I like to think like we have a strong barrier guarantees in terms of like uh, multi-tenancy. This notion of namespaces that you guys have is something that's really there. We are adding even more feature to really enable like that there's gonna be no noisy neighbor or anything like that. Those are like the right question. And that's why also like we are kind of like still working to like that wait list to really define and make sure that basically we don't have any of those contention. Um, but just so you know, a lot of things coming basically in temporal cloud to really like guarantee basically this isolation. Uh, and then also like this RBAC system that we talked about within the organization. So it's kind of like how within an organization, making sure that we have all the right security primitives in place. Uh, but then sure, as you're running, um, you know, as you're running basically on temporal cloud, you are getting the feeling that you are getting your own server. And it's really like in terms of isolation, it's not like you're sharing a namespace with another namespace exactly in the same, like you are getting, you know, on the same kind of like cluster, you are getting like a full visibility and isolation that you would get. Uh, but all of that is multi-tenant. Awesome. And then uh, I'll do, a little, so, and then David asked a question, I'll do a, a mini translation of it, but, um, uh, Temporal, when you're running in Temporal Cloud, will Temporal be providing any insight, help, et cetera, around managing workers in production? Or you know, how, how do we actually think about when and how to scale our workers? Yeah, and I mean, 
if, if you're part of this call and part of the community, as you can see, I mean, like, there's a tremendous help, no matter who you are, if you're using Temple Cloud or not. Like, we are here to help the community and help. So <laughs> ask your question, basically, on Slack like channel, and you're going to get your, your question answered. But for sure, when you start working with Temple Cloud, then we are here to provide value to you guys and, again, like, help. So, like, part of, like, the sales organization, we have also kind of, like, sales architect and cloud architect that are here to help you. There's dedicated engineering access. We have, basically, Slack access to the team. There's many, many things that we are providing, depending on what you need. Um, and then to exactly help you understand, like, how do you go to production and how to scale, basically, your workload. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely something that, that you get. Yeah, and I'd say this is a pretty. This is one of the more common questions we get: is production, you know, running running workers in production. So there is one um, a blog post and then a short video that I just linked in the the chat uh, where Samar and Sean go through things like operational metrics and how to think about monitoring, and alerting, incident response, upgrades, um, testing failure paths, and uh, I think that's a that's a really good base layer. And then as uh, I, I just echo all the things that Pierre said as well. Um, cool. Sorry, I'm just catching up on questions. Uh, and feel free also just to um, uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Yeah, so then, uh, for, for instance, people are asking about just like, what's the dev test um, uh, development kind of phase model? So yeah, for the for most part, all of our all of our customers running in, um, in the cloud um, are going to have uh, namespaces for like, you know, uh, staging, testing, prod. Um, it's a, a kind of a core, a core um, uh, feature set or setup for any of our customers. So yes, that's a supported model. I think Maybe I, I did. I'm not, I don't know if I got the entire question, Tim. But also, what we are seeing, kind of like in where we are, we are seeing people doing a lot of like still like local development. You might have like a simple version of like Temple Server for you to do your own local development. You know, like do that. And then it's really when you start kind of like thinking, okay, I want to run this in production at scale. You know, and more like for the production workload. Then that's when you can really uh, easily shift over, basically from. Whether you have whatever you're doing locally to to Temple Cloud, so we're kind of like actually seeing like even for company using Temple Cloud just for like a developer experience, local development, still using like some lighter version of like you know Temple Server, they can use it for them. But then really, when you say okay, now this needs to go to like staging or prod or whatever, then you just point basically to Temple Cloud at that moment. Nice. Uh, and then I can see Nick asked just um, uh, for folks who might have missed it, when is uh, Temporal Cloud just going to be generally available? We don't have a hard date. We're targeting uh, second half of this year. So, um, you know, marching towards eventually having a self-serve model, but uh, no official ETA we, we can share yet. And I think that actually covers off the yeah everything in the chat. So happy to pass it over to Sean or if there's additional questions, uh, we're here. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, look, like it's a it's an ongoing journey, and um, there's there's lots to ask. So if you're interested in more details, uh, definitely ping Tim and Pierre uh, in the Slack. Uh, but otherwise, I think this has been a really successful meetup, and I want to end on time. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, uh, and uh, you know, sign up for the future meetups at temporal.io/meetups. If you're interested in the city-based meetups, uh, you can join the individual Slack channels for each of them. I realize I don't have my video on. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much, and uh, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Ooh, lots of thanks in the chat. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I want to thank my oh, mom, thanks. dad, God. My producer, my agent. Um, all right. Bye, everyone. No slapping.